start the recording. Okay. We about to start. Hola. My name is Klaus and welcome to this talk about uh, microservice with Apache Camel. Um, this talk are in two parts. At first we start from the beginning where I talk about what Camel is. And then for the second part we get more practical where we build a microservice from scratch. And it's sort of like a three steps. We run it first standalone. Then we're going to take that what we build and dockerize it and build a docker image and run it with a Docker container. And then at the end we take this and run in a Kubernetes OpenShift environment. Okay, so a bit about myself. Uh, I've been working with Camel for quite many years, seven years or so. Also wrote a book together with Jonathan, Camel in Action. And we have some books as a giveaways that uh, Jonathan and the guys will <laughs> hand out as a raffle, I understand. Yes. And there's also books from Rob, uh, the Action Cube book as well. And just again talking all, all about this book, uh, we are currently working on a second edition as well. So, okay, so a lot of camel stuff. So, what is camel? Uh, anybody here? Please raise a hand if you've been trying camel or quite know about it. Okay, just for the video camera, it's about 10% or so in the audience. This is a great place to be to learn about camel, so you're in the right spot. Okay, so to learn about a new product, a good idea is to go to that product website and see what they say there, what it is. So if you go to the Camel website, we say two things. Camel is an integration framework and it's based on enterprise integration patterns. Okay, two facts. So what about integration framework? I kind of like to think about Camel as a toolbox which has ready-made tools to help you with your integration problems. So as a developer, you should not need to write code how to connect to a message broker to send messages to it, or how to receive from it, or how to upload files to an FTP server, how to send messages to Amazon, and so on and so on. Or don't have to write code how to handle errors and redelivery of messages and all kinds of stuff. All that are ready-made tools that comes out of the box from Camel. That it allows you to focus at a higher level about the business problem, and the lower level is taken care of by Camel. So I think count as that toolbox. What about enterprise integration patterns? What is that? Well, it's in fact a book with that same title. <laughs> okay, so what the hell is that about? So about 10 years ago, consultants, the authors of the book, Robbie Wolf and Gregor Bobby, they were consultants that went to client to client and helped them with the integration problems. And then they saw the same problems occur over and over again. As a good consultant, they wrote down about these problems and how to solve them. And over time, they got more and more notes about different problems. And then the idea of turning that into a formal book became, and they wrote this book. Now, they are, it's a typical American book, so it's 800 pages, very heavy. <laughs> and I'm not sure if any person on the planet that read it from cover to cover. That's right. I think I'm. 70% into the book, but it's a really good book. It's sort of like if you know the book for Gang of Force wrote about object-oriented programming. It's sort of the same kind of Bible we, we have for integration. Okay, so this book contains recipes to solve common problems. And in the computer language, we call them enterprise integration patterns. So in the book, there are 65 patterns how to solve these, and here on as a slide, we have some of those. You can go to the Camel website with the link down there and list all these patterns that Camel provides. There's a pa pattern called content-based route. This is probably one of the most famous ones. We're going to see that just in a moment. But you can also fill the message. You can route message dynamic. You can send them to a number of recipients. You can split and aggregate and so on and so on. So what I'd like to do now is in the following slides to talk about where Camel fit in to this about enterprise integration patterns. So the idea with the enterprise integration patterns is that you can go and use them in your architectural designs. And then the idea is that you can map those patterns into code that Camel can run. OK? 
Okay, so see how this goes. So to explain this, is I use a little example. If we have a sort of like an order system where we have new orders coming in, then depending what kind of order it is, you need to route it either to a widget or gadget. If you take the enterprise book, we can find a pattern for a solution for this. It's called the fund based route. And this is how it looks like in graphical illustration. But what we would like to do as well is to write down with English words that solution. Okay? So what we can do is to write from new order. Then we need to make a choice. When is widget to widget? Otherwise, to get it. Okay? Then, because, yeah, maybe because of something we have parentheses. <laughs> and then, you know, we have some dots. Yeah. <laughs> and the same code. <laughs> no, no, we just do that. Okay, so now we have sort of like something in English word you can read and kind of understand, but okay, let's take a close look at that blue stuff. What the hell is that? So the blue stuff are endpoints. So in this example, the messages that come from an endpoint, input endpoint, and in this example, we are using the message here coming from a message broker called Apache Action Queue, but we define it up there and the queue name is new one. Now, a widget. We need to figure out if this message is a widget message or not, and for that, we can use a predicate. A predicate is a function that has a boolean outcome, either true or false. So, what we can do is, depending on what kind of message it is, we are using XML, and therefore, we can use an XML language called XPath to look inside that method to see if it's a widget or not. Then the other two widgets and gadgets, those are also endpoints. This is where we send the method, either to a queue called widget or gadget. Okay, so there's a lot of English words here with dots and parentheses and semicolon. Mm. Have you seen something like this before? Yeah, it kind of looks like code, Java code. Okay, so Java code. You, you need to put that inside a method. So we put it inside a method, we call it configure. Okay, that's fine, I'm kidding. Uh, but a method needs to be in a class. We put it inside a class, and we call this my route. And that, what the hell is that? It says extends route builder. Route builder is the first clue about Camel. So route builder is a class from Camel that allows you to define routes in the configure method. So you can take this code, and it can compile and run. Quite awesome. If you've seen the ten percent of you guys that have seen Camel before, you may have seen that you can inline those endpoints and predicates and whatnot directly into that route. So this is the same code as before. Take this and put it inside. You can choose to start, but this is more short and this is often what you start out doing. But it might sometimes be good to do this way because it's more logical. It's separated. You have the solution down here. It doesn't matter what if the endpoints are different, you know, from a message program, from a file system, if the P is separate versus here it is in line. Okay? Also pay attention to it. I said before camera is a toolbox which has ready made tools to solve all these low level stuff. There's no you may, don't need to write as a developer any code here how to consume, connect to message to program, consume, listen for new messages on that queue, consume them, then execute an XPath expression to figure out if it's a true or false, and then depending on that, do an if else, and send the message to a video queue or not. All that is taken care of by Camel. You, at a very high level, you just write that routing code. Camel also allows you to write these routes in XML. So this is the same route, but just in XML, you can do it like that. Uh, another benefit with Camel is that it's easy to um, if configure endpoints using different components. So, for example, instead of picking up messages from a message program, you need to pick them up from the file system. All you have to do is change the input to file, the camel file component, and then specify the starting directory. And then you're done. You can then configure each component with some options what, that are component specific. So, for example, with the file component, you can tell it, okay, after you have processed this file, what should you do? You should delete it so it doesn't be picked up again. But you can also move it to some other directory or rename it or leave it as is. So each option, each camel component has different options you can configure. Uh, now if I tell you 
instead of sending the message to a get queue on the message broker, you need to upload that to an FTP server. It wouldn't be too hard to figure out how to that do, because you can change this inbound down here to an FTP component and specify a login name and a directory, and you're done. Not so hard to do. Okay. Um, also, what is awesome about Camel is just its Java code. There's no magic here. You can use your favorite editor and have all the powers from the editor to help you. So if you're writing tab, the browse in the configure method, you can use control space to find this um, list of methods to use with a pattern. So you, here I'm looking for some pattern to start with an if, and I, the list start with filter. And these uh, methods, enterprise patterns, have Java docs, so you can actually also, the tooling can show you the Java doc inside as well, so you can get some idea what it does. The same is about the XML. We have a schema behind it, and the schema also has documentation. So if you set up the tooling to understand the schema, it can show you uh, which patterns are there and what options they take and what are the documentation for these options and so on. So you have sort of like the top documentation for all the enterprise patterns at your fingertips. Okay, so this is a slide for the architects in, in, the, in the group here. They like having these high level uh, diagrams. So this is more or less all you need to know about, you know, architecture of camel. So, excuse me. So what we have here in the center is a call camel context. So camel context is camel, it's the runtime camel. So the idea is that you have a camel context, then you can add routes to it. And you can write these routes in Java code or XML or Scala, do it or not, camel doesn't really care. Then these routes can use enterprise integration patterns and you can call your own Java code and so on and so on. And to speak to the outside world, you use camel components. You see the file component, you see the actual MQ component, FTP, and so on and so on. There are a lot of components. In fact, we have more than 150 or some. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, when I started with Camel, we had less than 40, so it was quite easy to list them all in slide, but I've given up on that now. So I think, uh, I think there's a 40 here and 40 here and then no more. <laughs> but in the latest release, Camel 215, and especially 216, is that we have a, something called a Camel Catalog. So it has actually information about all the components and languages and data formats and whatnot this release contains, so we can actually have sort of like, you can just ask the catalog, how many components do we have? Or um, how many components do we have about database? Or how many components do we have something about uh, APIs or, or FTP or not? So they also associate with sort of like uh, a type of component, so it's easier to figure, find them, because you know, we'll suddenly we have so many, people get a bit confused. I need to talk to a database which component should I use, but using the camel catalog to sort of filter that and only these are the 10 you can use. Okay, so speaking of that, so what is camel? Okay, we learned that from the camel website there are two facts, integration framework, you know that toolbox, there was this book called Enterprise Integration Pattern, so you can kind of see the book is the sort of the theory and camel is the software implementation of that book. You define routes in camel, you can use Java code, XML, Scala, Groovy, or not. And there's even a Kotlin DSL. I think we're just waiting for 1.0 release, right, Jim? Um, you can define endpoints in Camel, you know, just file colon something. Uh, it's just Java code. There's no magic language or whatnot. And then for the microservice people in here, there's no container dependency. Camel is just a library, toolkit, framework, library, whatever. There's no server. You don't install it. You take Camel and you can add the jars to your class path, or how you can embed the libraries into your project. So in the core file, it's just in the web slip directory, uh, Spring Boot, you can run in the uh, J2E app servers, or OSGI on Keras, or IBM WebSphere, or all kinds of legacy servers and whatnot. So it's your choice. And in the microservice boot way, you know, it can be very lightweight, just tap it, camel core, and then choose which component you add, and those components often have additional third party dependencies which you need to add. But when you have all these JAR files, that's it. And this was from the very beginning. So this was eight years ago. It was very lightweight. 
Okay, so I often, so there's a little example. This is sort of like the hello world of integration. So um, this is taken from the camel book. So how do we copy a file from one directory to another? And this is how you can do it in camel, just a standalone Java main. First, you create a camel context. There's a new default con camel context. Then you add routes to it. And we can include the source in the same class. So here's the anonymous inline from file to file outbox. Then we need to start camel. The start operation is non blocking, so we need a way to keep that given running. And because this is just for test and demo, you just sleep for 10 seconds and then stop it. Okay, so now let's go to the second part, the, the more fun one. <laughs> so this is where we pray to the demo gods. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, build a microservice. And I wanted to build a microservice from scratch that you can do as well from home. So it's not some code I have prepared as sort of a secret. It's not some code that are, so let's say, Red Hat dependent or something like that. No, it's it's a microservice that are using um, out of the box Apache Camel uh, examples. So what we have here on the, uh, we have an Apache Tomcat, which we want to have a, a microservice, as a microservice. And then the Tomcat has a service that is both on ACP 8080, a hello service, you can call it. And then there's a camel route that route this message and transform the message and send it back <coughs> to a client. And the client is also a camel application, but it's a Java standalone using CDI that has a timer. So every fifth second, the timer triggers and call the ACP service. And you could build these using Maven archetypes. So Camel provides, or Maven provides something called an archetype you can use to create new products from scratch. Sort of like a skeleton, to create sort of like default product. And depending on what kind of archetype you use, you can use it for different things. So we have a bunch of Camel but you can also get from Wicked or all kinds of other products that are not camel specific. So this is a Maven standard. You can run it from the command line using Maven archetype generate or the tooling like Eclipse or Idea or whatnot. Those, those have Maven built in. So you can use a wizard in there. Also, there's a third tool called JBoss Forge. Uh, you can boot it up from the command line and you can use a product new command. And that command has also the ability to use a Maven archetype. From Camel, we ship all these ones. And what we're going to do here for the microservice is to use the web one for the Tomcat and the CDI for the standalone client. So for the CDI, this is the client code. So this is what the client generates. So uh, we have some uh, endpoints being injected, and down in the bottom, we have the route from an endpoint, call a beam, and log it. So what we need to do is, because this one doesn't call the HTTP, it's out of the box, it doesn't use HTTP to call another service. So we need to add that code. And to do that, we need to add a camel component that can talk to HTTP. And I would want to use the Neti component. We have a Neti component that, that can access the HTTP client. You can add that to your dependent palm file, or you can use a little bit of tooling. We have some camel or uh, JBoss uh, force tools. You can install inside Eclipse or ID or whatnot. And it has sort of like a wizard to add components. Then we need to change the endpoint. Uh, HTTP endpoint and change the route a bit, and a little bit more code. So we have to change the client code to call Tomcat. And we're going to use the standard Tomcat example out of the box. We don't change it, it's just generated since this is there. Okay, so let's try that. So here I have a shell, I type Maven archetype generate. And now it goes online on the internet, find all the known Maven archetypes to mankind, and then it lists it on your shell. It takes a little while, depending on the Wi-Fi. Uh, yes, here it is, 1378. Here you are, it's useful. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure you can see it on the screen. Uh, sorry, still a little smaller. Than... Oh, okay, so. So, you can fill it. Okay, this is because I plugged in the it mirrored my, it made my screen smaller. But, but you cannot see it, but no, number 77, that is the CDI one. So I can type 77. 
and then I can type some maybe uh, give it a Maven ID, a uh, Google ID, an artifact. So I post call it my CD and version 1.0 and enter, 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 enter. So at the end, it built the product, and in my directory, I should have a directory called my CDI. My CDI. Okay, so now I can go to the editor here, and I can open that. And it's in my documents, workspace, my CDI, <coughs> uh, I'm in the pom file. And now it's loading inside. You can use NetBeans or Eclipse or whatnot. And we have the source code here. And just going to enter presentation mode so we get more stuff. So this is the code we got in added. So what we need to do is to add the HTTP component so we can call that Tomcat service. And for that, I'm going to start Java Forge. Hopefully, it's going to come here. So this is Java Forge. It has some additional camel commands. And there's one called camel add components. I'm going to choose that one. And then it uses that camel catalog I talked about. So you can actually fill it by type. And I'm looking for something called HTTP. I choose HTTP. And then we have a list of HTTP related components. I'm going to use Netty4. OK, finish. So that's being added to the product. Then we need to use that HTTP component. So I'm just going to duplicate some code here and call it HTTP endpoint. And then Netty4 HTTP, that's the name of the component. And then I'm going to call localhost 8080 because that's where Tomcat runs. And I'm going to call the contact part my web. Camo, hello, that's the input name. Then I'm going to um, add two options, uh, which we're going to use a bit later. This, because I want this to be a one off call, I call it, and then I disconnect. Uh, keep alive equals false. So these are the two options I'm going to send. So now we have the endpoint for that. Now we need to change the code in the route to, do, to use our endpoint. So what I'm going to do is to, to call the HTTP endpoint here. And then I need to, the service I call, I need to provide a name that is using as a re so I can say hello cloud, for example. So I'm going to set a hello call uh, name. And then I'm going to use a Java bean to provide me that name. So I'm just going to reuse that bean something. So this is the route, set a hello call name. You do a method call, call the HTTP service, just log it. So we're going to go here and change the code here. And this is out of the box. We're going to change this one to say something else. Uh, uh, should use Jonathan now. <laughs> and you can testify I haven't uh, cheated or anything. <laughs> OK, delete it. So hopefully. Now we change that. Now we should be able to to build that one. If I ah my CDI, I need to be in the right directory, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it wasn't that clever. So now it hopefully built the code and everything is honky donkey. And I'm not going to build the web example because I already done that and I've deployed it inside Tomcat. Is Tomcat is running here with the my web. So what I can do is to co run this client standalone, and there's a camel plugin, camel maven plugin. You can use it to run it from your maven. So I just take maven camel colon run, maven camel colon run. Then it runs this client standalone, hopefully. And now it starts up using CDI. And you start to log down here. You say, hello, Jonathan 1, how are you today? <laughs> hello, Jonathan 2, how are you today? So yeah, that's quite, quite amazing, huh? <laughs> um, and just to show it, this is the web example. It comes straight out of the box from Apache Camel. That's no, it's not so exciting. Uh, this is how I also deployed Port.io in that uh, web console. So this is the Wonder.x console running inside Tomcat together with the LXM, so I can click Tomcat here, so I can see which Tomcat application is running. So this is my web, and this is Hot.io itself. 
and because we have camel, I can look at the camel route and so on and so on. So this was the good old days. So what I'm going to do now is shut down the standalone one and the client and go back to the slides. So uh, just what we did, we started Tomcat, we deployed the WAR file, you can execute the client in this case, hello Jonathan, or whatever you choose, and you can run it inside for you. So I put all the screenshots and commands and whatnot in the slides so you guys can use them later on. So in two weeks you might think, oh, what the fuck was this coming from? <laughs> I want to try it. So, you know, here's some slides and you can find the video and maybe you, know, you can get successful. So how do we, so there's been a lot of talk about Docker. Docker did, Docker that, Docker that. <laughs> so let's see how the camel and Docker do. So what we built here today, what we like to do is to take that code we built and be able to run it on Docker. And some people have told us, okay, you need to use a Docker image. Or build, provide that as a Docker image. Okay, so I have some Java code. How the hell do I get a Docker image? Well, you can use a Maven plugin. And one by Roland Hoos, who is also quite famous for building the Deluxe DMX stuff that maybe James mentioned in the morning. So we use his plugin, and you can add it manually, add some snippet of XML to your pom file and some other bits and bobs to make it work, or you can use the default command we have. So we have a sync command called fabric, uh, setup fabric, uh, that prepares this product for being able to build a Docker image. And you can use it also from your editor. You know, put up that menu and choose Fabric Setup. And I have to say, Fabric Setup is is the Docker to containerize your product, and then it has a bit of extra blobs that allows you to run it on Kubernetes. But you know, running it barefully without Kubernetes is fine. It doesn't have any impact. So it's sort of like you get two, you get uh, two and one for free, so to speak. You pay for one, you want to have it in Docker, but you also get the the cool stuff from Kubernetes. Uh, so, if you need to build it as a Docker image, you use the Docker build command. Maybe clean the start of Docker build, and that need to know which um, Docker reg uh, registry to uh, put the image in, and for that we use an environmental variable called Docker host. And uh, so up in the top slides, it depends if you use boot to Docker or if you're using Kubernetes, then you need to specify where it is. So if you do that for both of them, you can do the Docker image. This is a standard Docker command, and this list all the images, and you can find those we have been building. Then you need to run them, and I think James Tomorrow said the magic command is Docker run. Then you can run anything, right? So Docker run, and then again we, need, we want to see it on the terminal, so it is interactive, and then we need the port mapping. But we don't want random ports; we want to know the ports ahead of time. So we want to map 8080 to 8080 and 8777 to 8778. It seems like stupid to do, but then we, because the Docker container has internal ports and your Mac OS or whatever laptop you use has different ports, so those two can be different. But it's easy just to do the same number. So if you do, do this, you can use 8080 <coughs> to access that Tom application. Okay, now it runs, but what the hell is that IP address of this Docker container? It runs, but what should I type in my web browser to hit it? Okay, so you can use Docker PS to list the Docker processes, and then you can find the container ID where you run your Tomcat, and then you can look inside that using Docker inspect, and then there's a blob of JSON, and then you can find the IP address. Jesus. <laughs> there's, if you go to a Stack Overflow, there are a lot of people asking, where the hell is the IP address of this one? And then you get those ninja command call line people write, and an alias that can sort of script and hack this for you, but they haven't done that so easy. So when you get the IP address, you can type it in your browser and see it. Yay. But that was the server side, that was the Tomcat, but on the client side, the CDI one, it was using localhost, but that's not the, IP, that's not the correct, correct address anymore. So we need to change the code to that IP address. Okay, we do that. And then we can build the two images and run them, and they, they, are, they are nice. But again, isn't this something easier to do? And yes, there is. Um, James Beckham talked about Kubernetes, so Kubernetes makes this much easier. And yes, fabric is tilted 90 degrees. It's not because he's drunk or something. Well, sometimes we are, but, uh, <laughs> but it's to illustrate it's not a layer. It's not, not so as if you put at 
fabric on top of Kubernetes and then you run stuff above that. Fabricate, the product is intended to sort of set of microservices you can add on and use whatever you need to use. But you as a developer, you can just build above Kubernetes <coughs> or if you want, above OpenShift. So OpenShift is optional. Okay, 15, so 15 minutes for the fun stuff. So again, we have this microservice with the Tomcat application and the client. Uh, so we want to call a service and I think, okay, in the, in the morning keynote, James talked a bit about cattles and pets and I hope I don't step on somebody's toes saying that in the old world, the traditional worlds where you sort of had like a number of fixed boxes where you as a, a put, put an application server in and you maybe gave these boxes names like Donald and Doc, so everybody will say, okay, can you deploy this application on Donald? And so everybody knows the IP address of Donald's server. But in a dynamic world where, you know, in a cloud environment, where it's much more dynamic, it's like cattle, you know. Uh, it can be any of those herds of cattle. So there are many cows running around and your service just is out there somewhere, right? So it's a much more dynamic world. So how do we know where the hell that service is? Which cows would you lie, you know, skewed to, <laughs> to get? <laughs> So what we need to do is Kubernetes service. So I'm not sure, if there were three things this morning James said that as a developer you need to remember when you talk about Kubernetes. It was service was one of them, but also parts and replication controls. So parts, replication controllers, and service. So what is a service, a Kubernetes service? Well, it's an abstraction for a network connection to one or more parts. Okay, so anytime you need to access a service over the network, you can use a Kubernetes service. What is an abstraction? So, uh, and, and for that abstraction, it uses a pod. And again, what was a pod? Well, a pod was sort of like the minimum deployment unit inside Kubernetes that has one or more containers. Uh, but as James said, as a Java developer, you may only have one container with a JVM. In this example, we have one container with Tomcat. But you, you can have multiple containers if you want. For example, in Tomcat, you can have a memcache or something together, whatever. But the idea is that the pod shares the same life cycle. So if one of them dies, they all die. So they, they live together and die together. So, okay, so we use a Kubernetes service to get access to that service. But the cool thing about Kubernetes yeah. is that that service is given its unique IP address and port and it stays the same for the lifetime of that service. So you, as a client, only need to look up that service one time, get the IP number and the port number, and that's it. You never have to go and look for a new. You don't have to add some Kubernetes libraries or Java libraries or whatnot, or look up in Zookeeper registry or whatnot to figure out what are the current list of running services. Did it go there? Did it fail over there? No. You get one IP and one port, and then you're done. That's pretty awesome. So how do we expose that service inside our wall, inside the Tomcat application? Okay, to do that, we can add three lines in the POM file. The service name, we call it my cool service. Then we need to use two port numbers. One is the inside, the container port. What is inside that container? What is the IP uh, port number? And because we use standard vanilla Tomcat, it's 8080. Okay, that's the inside one. Then we need to use the outside one. And I could freely choose anyone because, you know, as Kubernetes service in IP and a port. And sometimes you can use the same number, 8080, but I don't do that because then people might be confused. It must be the same. So, so if you write a service, then you might use 4040 or some other port number. And then you think, okay, I, they have to be the same. So every time you duplicate it, it's wrong. You can freely choose one. Okay? Then. Um, the Fabricate has a Maven goal that can spit out the needed metadata that Kubernetes uses as a JSON file or a YAML file, but it generates a JSON file. So if you don't use these three lines, generate that one. But you are free to use, you can of course write this by hand if you want. So this is the service. This is what Kubernetes understands. So what about on the client side? So on the CDI extent, we need to access that service. So the, this is the second part where Kubernetes service is really awesome. 
is because on the client side, it's just environmental variables. So on the client side, what happens is that when Kubernetes starts this container, or this port, the OS that's inside there has these environmental variables injected automatically. So if you have a service called FooBar, or in our example, it's called MySQL service, then there are two environmental variables, service host and service port. Then, as a client, you can just get the host and the port, and that's it. Again, on the client side, you don't need to have any special JAR files or libraries or whatnot in any program. It's just an environmental variable lookup, and any decent developer in any decent programming language can do that. Even Visual Basic guys can probably figure this out. <laughs> okay, so in Camel, we made that even easier. So to refer to a service in the Camel endpoint, you can use squiggly parentheses, service, colon, the name. So what we need to do now is to change our ACP client to use that service. And then we're ready. How, how is the time? Ten minutes, okay. So, okay, so what I can do here is first, I'm going to again use the setup, uh, for share. So I'm using this panel command to set up that um, Docker stuff. So, and I'm going to choose Docker. And yes, this is the main. And then I can choose an icon. I want to use Camel instead of FTMQ. And apparently there's a box somehow. We have a little test here. I'm not sure why. <laughs> so I just and um, that's it. So now um, we have the Docker plugin and everything is honky donkey almost. Um, then we need to change the to use that service. So we're going to up here in the endpoint instead of localhost. We're going to refer to that service. So localhost gone. Service colon my cool service and squiggly. That should be. It. So now this one should be able to compile. Um, Maven clean install Docker. Let's just Docker build it. So let's see if that works. Yes, something happened. Good. So now it runs, you might not see it, Docker Maven plugin started running down in the bottom. So it's actually building a Docker image node uh, with that source code we chained and put it inside that image. So we will be able to run it standalone as a Docker, but more better is to run it inside Kubernetes. So it takes just a little time. Yes. Okay, yeah, so JBoss Force, you can run it inside IntelliJ, NetBeams, Eclipse, and from the command line, and also on the web as a web console, but it's not yet there, but they're coming. So you can add custom Hamilton buttons as well to the project? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so in interest of time, what, the only thing I need to do is to actually, let's just apply it. This. Okay, so this is where, now I'll actually de deploy this Jonathan inside the Kubernetes. I have boot up Kubernetes, it's running here on my laptop. Um, oops, get calls. I have some calls running. I actually have it preloaded. I have a previous example, my CDI running already, but now we actually live taking the code I just built and using Jonathan as the name to see if that is, uh, it works. So it will do that here in the background. Uh, I can go and show here the web console. I guess you guys have seen it already, but we have the Tomcat here and the CDI is actually running. And now we actually live deploying a new version of it where it uses Jonathan as the name. And let's see how that goes. It seems it's okay here and it should, it's running. If I look at the parts, go down here, my camel, this is the camel, it's been started for 11 seconds. Okay, so I can show you, we have some command line, OpenShift has some command line that makes things a bit easier to look at. But it's pure Docker, I can also just use Docker PS to see the Docker process. 
So there's no, you can use Dargo or OpenShift commands. So OpenShift get parts, I can see the parts. I just want to see if this is the name of the part. So there's a command to log. So it shows the log of that command. And if we actually log, it says, hello, Jonathan, eight, nine, 10. So this is the new stuff we just deployed with Jonathan. Okay, so five. So what we can do as well is to scale up and down. So we have one Tomcat running here on controllers. And instead of having one only, we can actually change it to three or something. So it should be pretty fast. Now there's two on the way, two, one, three, three. So now we have three Tomcats. And they should come down here. Da -da -da. And they get assigned, the, oh, you can't see it, but I can't scroll it out here. Uh -huh. But they get assigned their own IP addresses and everything. Uh, yes, they are here. So if you go and look at the logs, um, so what you should be able to see is here, hi I and my web and then something. And here is a different value. And it's sort of changing this value. This is because there's now three Tomcat, not only one. So the service on the client side is still the same, my full service, but Kubernetes has a load balancer built in, so it just load balance between the active service. And on the client side, you don't change anything because the Kubernetes service stays the same all the fucking time. So you're good to go. So I can go down and let's be an ass and go back to one. Uh, sorry, that's this one, the blue one. So let's go back to one. So this is, so now we're going back to one, but I would like to, to be an ass and see what happens if I am uh, a bad boy, so I'm just gonna kill this one. So let's kill it, let's kill the cat, you know? It's not pet, so you can, it's not your little dog, so you can just kill the cat. Oh, see, delete part, and then the name of it. So, but it goes so fast that you can probably not see it, but Kubernetes is monitoring and has sort of like self-healing capabilities and figures out, okay, one of the cattle dies, it's a Tomcat cattle, the replication desired state is one, so okay, find a new cow and install Tomcat on that. So now we have Tomcat running again, but what happens is that the client is still trying to call this service and it takes a little while before Tomcat are up and back and running. Now it's up and running, Jonathan 39. So now we have Tomcat again. Clients keep running. But you get these horrible stack traces up here. This is because in the client side of Camel, we haven't built any re-delivery possibility. We could have that. Uh, had an error handler and Camel saying, okay, call this service, but if the service is down, you can, you know, gracefully try again. But, so now we are all happy again. Just one last thing you haven't seen is, oh, here, I already did that. So we have centralized logging inside the as a microservice. So this is the Kibana web console that can visualize all the logs for all the containers and all the pods. And I have pre-configured it to only log from the pods that is named with my CDI. So we can see here all the logs for this one. And it's, uh, you get something with the stack trace and whatnot. So we have all the logging here on the console. So we can see, you can go back in time and whatnot. Okay, we are getting close to out of time. Is there uh, any questions? Oh. And of course, you in the web console, you can also get that camel uh, diagram. So we can go and look at the my web one here. So this is looking inside the Tomcat one, and you can see the diagram as well. And here it is. Let me just uh, zoom out a bit. Okay, so. Uh, that's a question in the back, yes sir? Yes, um, well, Camel has different, um, uh, it's called data formats to work with uh, formatting, uh, 
transforming in, into different. So you can work with JSON, XML, or CSV files and whatnot. These kind of formats you can use with, with Camel. So you can build a service that accepts JSON or XML and outspin uh, return as JSON. You can use Jack. You can also use Java libraries with JSON, like JSON or Extreme and those kind of things. Okay, then. Yeah, you can work with uh, Java objects internally. So if you can map that to that, and then you know you can just use Jackson to spit it out as JSON. So you know there are some examples of that on the Camel website. You definitely work with that. <laughs> yes, so the good guy in the back. Yes. Two fingers. <laughs> uh, on a Mac, it's uh, L or Yopsin and the command key, those two next to the space. And then, for some reason, it's number four. <laughs> Maybe it was number one failed, number two was failed. <laughs> then you get this uh, command list, and you can choose uh, various uh, forge commands. And there, there are one for Fabric here, and there's some generate one for Forge. But you have one at the add component. But there's also data format. You ask about JSON, so we can look at that and see what we can do from. Uh, we don't have. Uh, so here you can choose something like JSON uh, for Jackson, if you want to use that one, and then finish. Um, and what is not working is the. Yes, in the XML version. So if you have some source code in there, yeah, yeah, let's post. Uh, open the, uh, the other one. Uh, sorry, but my left. Here it is. So if you have routes defining in uh, in uh, XML, these camel commands, we have a number of camel commands that can actually uh, modify the endpoints using uh, tooling instead of having to write them by hand. So let's see if that actually works. But again, <laughs> two fingers in number four. And here we have suddenly edit endpoint XML or add endpoint XML. So we can try edit. Then it figures out, okay, which endpoints do we have in your route? And this is the simple one, you only have the server one. Ah, okay. So here are all the options on the server component. I can you know, specify them. Uh, and sometimes there's a little block I can see. But then the idea is that it, those are dependent on what kind of camel component you're using. Now this is a server, these are these options. If you use the GMS, it's a different and file component and so on and so on. So it's a way of assisting you to uh, work with camel endpoints in a more type safe way instead of having to type in a long text. Okay, uh, other questions? Out of time. So um, if you want to, to build a URI, just using the string yes. in your code. You don't have uh, any help from the IDE just to autocomplete the components or the options of every of the components? The question was, yes, if you're using the string, edit the endpoint as a string in the editor, you don't have any code assistance. That is true today, but the idea with the Canon catalog is that it will provide us with the repository to know about which options there are. So the idea is to take this one step further. So when you edit the endpoints in the editor, whether it's Java, XML, it's inline, so control space, and it shows little menu of them, and then you work in that. But that is more complicated just to build a form. Yeah. But we will get there. This is the first step. So the form <coughs> understands the options, so we'll be able to that. And it can also maybe squiggly under them, miss one of them, mismatch so in wrong. So we will give more. Uh, maybe also build a tool you can run as a Maven plugin or something part of your build that can validate these at that time instead of runtime you might get some errors. Okay. So there's a lot more power coming to that tooling stuff. Yes, sir, in the back. So could you show adding a brand new component in that you can Yeah, yeah. So, this is a good friend. <laughs> uh, CXF, I never use that. Okay, so let's fill something I never use, uh, some sprint stuff maybe. Uh, what should it be? Let's kill. Yeah, PG event. Is that Postgres event? I think it is. Is that it? Yeah. Now, 
It chased the pump, but uh, it's down here in the pump somewhere. Let's find it. Here. <coughs> PG event. So, it's, you know, what happens under the covers is that the command goes and look inside your main pump file and figure out, okay, what is the uh, artifact ID and group ID and the version number, and that goes into your pump file. So, it manages that. <laughs> oh, you're really on the road, huh? <laughs> <laughs> In XML, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got to find. Oh shit! <laughs> you want the PG event, right? And call it PG foo. Call it PG event. Oh, something here. So local host. Um, these are the default values that this option has, and it says data mate must be provided. So this is the mandatory option. So this the uh, uh, cool stuff. Channel, ah, channel is also down here. <laughs> so, okay, let's find that XML file. Jesus. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, the screen is not, but it's here, <coughs> very long. Oh, that's one thing you can do in um, the new version of Canvas, you can actually break these long ones here, so, uh, so you'll, you'll be able to, you know, line breaks and have the options on each line if you want. So you can do um, something like that. So you can format the long endpoints, if they are really long, it can happen sometimes, you can actually specify them on a line by line. And there's also this spring kind of style where you can sort of like have a, a name and of name and value, name and value, name and value. So, other interesting <laughs> questions? <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, so where can you get the tooling of that one? Um, uh, the slides, yes, at the end. So it was supposed to be about microservice. There was some microservice, but we have a camel website uh, link called Camel Boot. Um, I'm not sure why we got that name. Now Spring Boot is popular, so, so we saw Camel can also do something like that. So there's a link there where you can sort of give you ideas how to run Camel microservice in a very minimal way. Uh, the Fabric Gateway file. If you really want to get in touch with us, we are really on the chat a lot. That's where we talk to each other as well, and also about what we are doing and who is doing what and whatnot. So, really open mind the community. And the Kubernetes. And the Camel website, yeah. There's a lot of information there, and the book as well. So, go buy that one. And yeah, I get one dollar, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have to pay him 30 euros for the five books. <laughs> Because of talk at customs fee or something like that. Yeah. They were sent from the United States, so they were supposed to be free from manning the publisher. So, well, but you guys, you got kind of screwed because you have to pay 30 euro to, to get the custom clearance. So, anyway, um, yes. So, camera is awesome. Uh, if you ask too many questions, you get a. <laughs> yes, James, two fingers. The two one in extra space, number four. Okay, I think that's the uh, next one. Uh...